So before we stop, we're going to talk a little bit about how you can use PLS for building classification models. It's basically straightforward PLS, but it, it, it gets a little bit complicated because we're using a sort of a funny Y variable. Uh, and we have a lot of diagnostics for telling how well we're doing. Uh, but we'll take that as we uh, move along. Um, so let's take an example. Let's say I measured some spectra of some coffee samples and some tea samples. And now I would like to be able to, from the spectrum, say to say whether it's a coffee or a tea sample. So the way we do that here is that we make a Y that has only ones and zeros. It has ones if it's a coffee sample, and it has zeros if it's a T sample. Uh, and then basically we just do a PLS model and try to predict that. So if I get something close to one, then it means it's a coffee sample. And if I get something close to zero, it must be a T sample. And that's what we call PLS DA, PLS uh, discriminant analysis. Now, when I get my predictions, they're not going to be actually ones and zero. They're going to be around that. If it's a, let's say, if it's not a very good model, the numbers can be whatever. But normally they would be around zero and one. And to actually make the classification, then, then I would have to set a threshold somehow. So if I predict y to be one, then I should definitely call it a sample, a coffee. If I predict it to zero, it's t. But what if, what if it's in between? I need to define some kind of uh, threshold. Um, and there are different ways of doing that. Uh, there are also there are many different approaches. Uh, some split at a half. Some uh, just look at who gets the highest uh, uh, prediction, things like that. We're not going to go into detail with that. Uh, we, we are more uh, interested in the, in the sort of overall concepts. Uh, but there are different ways to assign classes um, uh, to a sample. What's important to understand is that, let, let's take a look at the predictions. Here I made a PLSDA model uh, based on some samples of different countries, trying to predict if a country is a developed country or not. So, so all these samples that are over here, they were having a zero in Y. And all the samples over here were having a one. So that's why the y measured is exactly zero and exactly one. And now I would have liked all these samples to be just around one, but you can see they kind of spread out. So probably this developed country is, uh, after all, not that uh, very developed because it gets a very low um, uh, prediction. And likewise here uh, on the on the, the non-developed countries, we see that we get a number of different predictions ranging from even minus one up to 0.7 or something like that. So it's, it's a little bit difficult uh, to get a perfect classification here because no matter what threshold I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose, I will uh, uh, run into some kind uh, of problems. So we have to decide where the threshold is and how do we do that how do we figure out what's the right place to put the threshold well if we're talking about uh pls there are many approaches uh, for doing that and, and if you're specifically using pls toolbox you can have a look at some of these link here uh, links and see uh, how it's done in pls toolbox but um, that's just uh, one approach uh, for this uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the numbers that we use to qualify how good is the model. Now, if, if we do PLS, then we would usually look at the prediction error, maybe the cross-validated prediction error. And we can do the same in PLSDA. We can look at how many components do I need to get a good prediction of the zeros and ones. And, and you should actually, just from the fact that we're predicting zeros and ones, you should have an idea about what do we expect the RMSE CV to be. I, I'm guessing that if we have a nice model, the, the average error should be much smaller than a half, right? Because otherwise we cannot sort of distinguish between a zero and a one. Um, so if we get an error that is much smaller than that, 
if we have an average error of 0 0.1, that must be a perfect model that can classify all the samples. But we're not really interested in, um, in, in predicting the 0 and 1. That, that's not really the aim of a classification. In PLS, normal PLS, that is the aim, predicting uh, the, the Y variable. Uh, that's actually exactly what we want. But here, this is just a, a remedy for something else. What we really want is to classify our samples correctly. And we have a number of um, um, tools uh, for assessing how well uh, we are um, classifying. So, for example, we have something called sensitivity. And the sensitivity is how many of the positives are correctly classified. And positive here means that belongs to the class. How many coffee samples do we actually uh, capture as being coffee samples? The specificity is the fraction of negatives that are correctly identified. So, how many of the non-coffees are called non-coffee. This is also referred to as the true positive rate and the true negative rate. And if you come from analytical chemistry, you will note that the terms sensitivity and specificity are used in a different way here. And as I just said, negative and positive is, is not a it, it, it's it, it's just whether you're in the class or not. So if I have a classification model that tells if we're coffee or not, positive means coffee and negative means non-coffee. And just like we have true positive rate, we also have false positive rate and false negative rate. And I know it's confusing with all these numbers, but if you sit and think about it, it's not too complicated if you take them uh, one by one. So remember that the sensitivity is how many of the positives do we uh, capture and the specificity is sort of the opposite or well, how many of the negatives do we find. Let's look at the data set. This is uh, the average height uh, of uh, males and females in different countries. Um, and let's say I want to classify whether you're man or woman uh, depending on uh, your height. And let's say I put a threshold. Uh, let's say I, no, let me actually not say 160. Let me say 150. Let's say that if you're above 150, then you're a man. And if you're below, you're not. So how well would that work? Would that classification model have a high sensitivity? And would it have a high specificity? Well, if you think about it, if I say that everyone above 150 is a man, I'm basically going to call everyone a man. So my sensitivity is going to be excellent. I'm going to get all the men uh, correctly. But my specificity is going to be terrible. So probably that's not the right way to go. Well, I could do the opposite. I, I could uh, sort of uh, have a threshold uh, on the high end, saying everything above two meters is a uh, is a man, and then I would get all the women right, but the men would all be wrong. And in the end, you would probably choose something in between, like 160, 165, or something like that. But you can see that then that model would definitely not be perfect. We wouldn't be able to get all the um, all the classifications right. It might be easier to see if we plot the heights as a uh, histogram. So here's a histogram of um, all the uh, men and women. And you can sort of see that there is no threshold. There's nowhere to, to put the green bar that will actually give me a perfect um, classification. So I can have perfect sensitivity if I want to sacrifice specificity and I can have the opposite. And in between, I will have different compromises. So once you have a classification model, for example, built by PLS, you also have to decide where you put this threshold because that will define how you weigh specificity uh, versus sensitivity. And in order to see that, see that compromise that you are trying to reach, uh, well, we have something which is called an receiver operating characteristic curve. Sorry. <laughs> 
so that's a rock curve. And basically it tells you, depending on your choice, what threshold you set, what the relation will be between the sensitivity and the specificity. So for example, I can easily have a perfect sensitivity. I can capture all the males, but then I'm gonna miss out on all the women. And likewise, I can do the opposite. I can get all the women right, but then I'm gonna miss out on all the men. And as I move along with my threshold on the height, we can't actually see what the value is, but then I will get different compromises between the, uh, the sensitivity and the specificity. So a perfect model would be up here. That would mean that uh, I could get perfect both sensitivity and specificity. A lousy model, a random model, a coin flipping would be right here on the diagonal. This is a very nice plot for seeing uh, a little bit of detail about your model. Normally when we do it in PLS, we would have not only this rock curve, but also the one for the cross validation, for example. Uh, and the similarity of those two would tell us a little bit about whether we are overfitting or not. There's a small number down here that you should know. AUC, that is area under the curve. Um, and that's a way to sum up what we're seeing in, uh, in this plot here. Um, I told you before that a perfect model would be here. And since the uh, axis here goes from 0 to 1, this uh, curve would have an area of 1. Whereas this so random classification would have an, have an area of a half. The area on the under the curve simply tells me how nice the model is. In this case, we can see it's 0.96, indicating that this is a quite nice model, well, depending on uh, what we require from the model. Um, so the AUC is a very uh, convenient way to sum up what the rock curve is showing us. Now, the rock curve is around here because we have overlap between men and women. There's no perfect uh, way to separate uh, men and women based on the height alone. But if we take a look at, sorry, uh, first let's uh, just uh, mention this. This is the rock curve for men. How well do I classify men? Uh, I hope that it's sort of obvious that if I look at a similar curve for women, it's gonna be the same, just sort of flipped around uh, over this axis. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a mirror image uh, of this one. Um, so there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between men and women. Uh, and that goes for when we are have a, we're having a binary classification. If I have more classes, then it's uh, more complicated. So men and women have overlapping heights. If we take some other creature uh, which is uh, more different, and I, I don't know my Lord of Rings uh, uh, too well, uh, but this apparently is a creature slightly higher than men. Uh, and we see now that there's a perfect separation uh, between uh, the, the two classes. So how would you expect that the rock curve uh, would look on something like this? Well, that's going to be what we call a perfect rock curve. That's going to be um, perfect uh, specificity and sensitivity at the same time. Uh, so that's very nice. Oh, by the way, the red dot is just something shown here in the PLS toolbox. It's indicating what the actual uh, threshold is, the threshold that was chosen um, automatically by the software. Okay, there's a few more um, things we need to discuss uh, for a, a classification model. One is that we have something called the confusion table. And it sim simply tells me how many of the current class that I want to classify are predicted correctly and how many are uh, put in the wrong class and vice versa. So that's the true positives and the positives that ended up being wrongly classified are the false negatives. And then we have the true negatives correctly classified and the negatives that ended up being called the class. So they are the false uh, positives. Now we can use these numbers to calculate a kind of a correlation coefficient. Uh, 
uh, made for, for this kind of uh, data. It's, it's basically Pearson's correlation, but just adapted uh, to this situation. I, I'm not going to explain uh, the formula, the equation. But, but it works in the same way as a, as, as a normal correlation. So if you get a correlation of one that indicates perfect agreement, for example, between your classification and the actual classification, and minus one, then the opposite, and zero basically means same as random. And the nice thing about the correlation coefficient is that it works quite well also when you have um, classes uh, with a very different number of uh, samples in each class. Uh, so that's a nice way to sum up uh, the result of your classification.